Hey there, Crystal Covington here, founder of Women of Denver, here with another member interview to share with you the lovely Melissa Blair, director of Spitfire Strategies. So we're going to ask her a few questions to get to know her journey and some of the things that she's doing now as a leader. So Melissa, I'm excited to talk with you. Tell us a little bit about your career. Thanks so much, Crystal. I'm so excited to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so as you mentioned, I am a director with Spitfire Strategies based in the Denver office. Um, so what Spitfire Strategies does is we consult directly with nonprofits and foundations to develop communication strategies. And so that's sort of been the crux of my entire career. I initially started working in health sciences and business and finding there needed to be a way to combine the two. And that kind of landed in something called social marketing, which is essentially developing marketing strategies to help with any sort of social impact or social change. So I actually studied initially in Canada. I did my master's in the UK. I lived for four years in Australia, working and consulting there. And then I had a startup that was actually in professional sport that brought me to America. So that's how I ended up and landed in Denver. Um, and once I shifted out of that startup and wanting to get back focused in social impact, I started with Spitfire Strategies. So I've been with the company almost a year now. Um, and yeah, I work with some really amazing nonprofits and foundations here, even in Denver. So we work with the Denver Foundation, Colorado Health, Colorado Health Foundation. Um, and yeah, we're doing some this past year. I mean, it's never been more important to have social change, social impact. So we've been insanely busy um, and developing some really meaningful work um, that you can see the impact directly on the ground. So it's really exciting. Okay, so now that you've revealed that you have this global perspective, I need to know how does that global perspective inform the work you do? And even especially over the past year, how did it inform your thought process as you watched all the things going down over the past yes, <laughs> year yes. of our lives? It's a really good question. And so it's been a huge learning curve for me working in America. I, I worked, as I mentioned, Canada, UK, and Australia, and those are all Commonwealth nations. And so the government structure is a little bit sim more similar there. And here it's quite different. So I had, you know, a lot to learn around systems and structures and how they work in America. And for example, I worked on a campaign to help reduce breast cancer in women. And one of the things typically in those other countries we could do is just encourage women to go get mammograms. We would identify what are the barriers holding them back? You know, what are those personal questions they have or, or resistancy? Is it laziness? Is it don't have time to book it? What is it? Whereas here in America, you can't just do that. You can't just tell women, go get a mammogram because there's so many other systematic and structural things that need to be changed first. Women don't have doctors. They don't have access to healthcare. They don't have insurance. So unless you're solving all of those elements, you can't just go out there and individually tell someone to go do something when there's such barriers to actually getting that thing done. So that's been a huge, huge learning curve. Um, obviously being here through a massive uprising of building racial equity has been super important. We've really focused our work on that. We developed a pro bono fund where we put $100,000 into five different nonprofits, specifically working to raise racial equity and equality. Um, and as well, during the election, you know, we worked with some really incredible organizations doing things to help reduce voter suppression, um, encourage voter turnout. You know, we worked with a client in Florida that is helping uh, what they call uh, returning citizens or, or ex-felons to be able to restore the rights to vote. And that was incredible because like I said, you could see the direct impact of our work. You know, 50,000 returning citizens were able to go out there and place their vote, which they couldn't before. So um, the world in America is obviously quite turbulent and intense, but uh, there's been a lot of really meaningful work that's been taking place as well. Sounds like it. You've excited me with some of the things you just said. <laughs> I, even I'm learning about a lot of these things and I, I, I thought I was, you know, well informed before, but this past um, couple of years of my life, have, it's like you just keep learning and you realize, okay, there's all these, these nuances to life and nuances to government that we don't, we take for granted and we don't understand. And from an outsider perspective, you actually get the chance to say, of course, I don't know, I'm new here and you're diving in and learning where you can support and help. And so being involved in social impact, I mean, there's been a lot of changes that happened in that industry, nonprofit and social enterprise, profit, profit seeking companies, you know, they all kind of had a challenges and fundraising in the way that they had to be able to make their impact and do things. What changed in your industry? And what do you think is the future looks like for the work that you do? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, 
with the government structure being in the way it is, I feel like a lot of this social impact does fall on the civil society groups, so on the nonprofits and foundations. And so, you know, when the pandemic swept through, they all had to pivot and find ways to support their their beneficiaries, but in different ways. And also, as you mentioned, you know, still secure the funding that they normally have. Um, you, as I mentioned, I work with the Denver Foundation. What they did was unlock a lot of different funds that they had stored in different places to be able to provide emergency relief. In other nonprofits that I've worked with, you know, they need to get really creative. They typically have a spring gala where they would raise a huge portion of their money. Or I work with a nonprofit called uh, San Jose Jazz, and they do this huge summer jazz festival, which they can't host in person anymore. So now they're thinking, okay, what are really interesting creative ways we can still connect with those donors and provide them something they love, which is live music. So they've created a new fund where you can choose a specific artist, you can sponsor them directly, and then you get a free, or not a free, but you get a concert in return directly uh, on Zoom to you. So it's a way to give a really personalized experience, but still give the donors what they're looking for, still get your money. So yeah, coming up with really creative and interesting ways to basically bring everything in a virtual world. Awesome. Yeah, I've, I've watched we had uh, several nonprofits that have been members of our organization and I got to kind of see some of the things that they've been doing and hearing them talk through it. It's just, it's amazing the amount of innovation that had to happen. That's going to change the way they do business forever and change the way they fundraise and change the way they serve. Um, and some of it was really great things that will help them, you know, that would have been great in the past, but they didn't have to think about it. So, yes, it's for, certainly made organizations a lot more nimble, uh, yeah. thinking quickly on their feet. And, you know, one thing I always think about is the curbside uh, pickup that is at most, you know, retails now, that's not going away. And there's a lot of things that have been put in place due to the pandemic that I don't think are going away, which um, will help to propel these organizations forward. And then I think the other thing, is the focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion. I think that some companies were thinking about that before, but now if you're not, and you're not training employees, you're not bringing that into the DNA of who the company is, then you're not gonna survive in this market. So I think that's been the other huge shift is how and what organizations are doing to respond to make sure that they are thinking consistently and living values of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Yeah. So what's one thing you're really excited that you achieved this year or in the, just in your recent past, what's something you're really proud of? Um, well, as I mentioned, that campaign in Florida was, was super challenging, super exciting. We got 50,000 ex-returning citizens uh, able to go out to register to vote and vote, which was incredible. Um, the leader of the organization, Desmond Mead, you know, we were fending off news sources that wanted to talk to him. It was, I've never seen more coverage for something. Um, so that was incredible. It was really incredible to see how that all came together. Um, and we've been doing a lot of other really neat and interesting work. Uh, we, we do a lot of work actually with international clients around digital rights as well. And so protecting digital and user rights. And so in Africa, you know, some of the things that came out of the pandemic was the government's ability to be able to tap into people's personal uh, private privacy and digital files. And so we've been doing a lot of work to kind of defend that and make sure that, you know, we're putting up letters to the UN that are ensuring that throughout this craziness across the world, that human rights is still coming number one. So um, I think that that's been really interesting. And then, yeah, like I said, my, my organization is so focused on equity, diversity, inclusion, that I've been super proud to be a part of that group to, um, you know, consistently ensure that we internally reflect those values, but externally are helping our clients to reflect those values as well in a very real and meaningful way. Yeah, you're amazing. I'm so I'm so excited that you're part of this organization. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I love I love Women of Denver. And I was so excited to find the group when I first moved to Denver and I found a lot of connections through it. So I'm really excited to be back and to, you know, reinvigorate this relationship. Love it. Well, thank you. So my last question is, what do you enjoy most about being a member of Women of Denver? Yeah, cool. So as I mentioned, when I was in Denver before in 2019, I was able to attend some of the events and the conferences and I just loved well, one, I love why you started the organization. I love that it sparked out of your desire to want to connect with other women in this space and to, you know, build your own networks through that. And then two, now just like we need connection more than anything. <laughs> I'm missing those networking events. I'm missing those conferences. That's what gets me going. And so I'm just excited to be back a part of the space to be able to join the virtual events, you know, maybe social distancing events in the near future. And yeah, and connect with other powerful, beautiful women that are doing great work in the space. Um, 
and seeing you know how they're bringing life into Denver as well because Denver is such a growing uh, market that has so many things to offer both professionally and personally. So it's just nice to be in that kind of crowd of people. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to let me spread the word about how amazing you are and tell a little <laughs> bit about some of the work that you do, you're doing. And I look forward to seeing you at an event soon. Thank you so much, Crystal. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me.